Hello, everyone. Steve Lynch here with the Inside Wire. It is February 2nd, 2016. 2016. I've got to keep reminding myself to say 2016. You know, back last century, we never did say 1,986. I mean, you know, we just said the said it the right way. Anyway, presented materials for educational purposes only today and should not be construed as personalized financial advice. Past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. Welcome, everyone. Uh, what I want to do today is update the RSI credit spread approach that we have been monitoring for several years. Last time I took a look at this was well over about a, over a year and a half ago. And so I want to walk you through this. We'll update the study, show the returns, the results, and everything here. So let me click, take you through this. Boom. There we go. All right, what's the, here's the outline. What is RSI? We'll look at what signals are. We'll look at a trading plan. Anatomy of two trades. I think I got rid of that in this presentation. Of, uh, I had a, a, a much more extended version of this when I was doing this for other parties out there, uh, when I would go to a trade show and, and display this, just because this thing, uh, just this is going to show, you'll see here, 94% winners. 94% winners using this approach. So it's pretty awesome. I mean, of all the approaches, if ever I've been tempted to say, gosh, this is so good, I better not teach it to anybody. If ever that has been in, the, in my mind at all, it's been with this thing. All right, and you'll see in just a little bit, it's quite powerful. So the anatomy, I don't think we're going to look at the anatomy of two trades. It's pretty easy to understand. And then we'll look at some testing results here. By the way, I've done this a couple times in the past. You can go into the Inside Wire archives, go back, and you could just do a Control F, just search for the word, you know, just search for RSI, and you'll come across it in 14 and then in years prior as well. Okay, here's the notion though. Here's the premise. When a trend is about to end, okay, we're going to sell option premium just over a standard deviation out of the money and challenge the market to move that far. Okay, so once again, once the market's been trending and we can sense that it's about to end that trend, we're going to sell premium an extra standard deviation away and challenge the market to then gather itself and move yet another more than a standard deviation after it's already shown signs of waning. It's a very good premise. It has, it's, it's a powerful premise. The only question is, how can you tell when the trend is about to end? And that's why that's what brings us to the RSI. Okay. What is the RSI? Wells Wilder, back in the 1970s. This is a great book. Just to have it, it is perhaps one of the most important. Well, it is. It's what definitely one of the most important trading books uh, that has ever been published in, in the world of technical analysis. He had new concepts there that are still with us today. Besides RSI, he had the whole directional movement, average true range, um, DMI, ADX. What else did he have in there? There was some important stuff. RSI, of course. And he had, and he had other things that people haven't really teed off on much. Uh, parabolic is in there as well. And he did it all by hand, no computers. He created spreadsheets. And you'll see in the, in the RSI, he threw in a, the spreadsheet approach to doing this rather than the computer. Um, but it, it's impressive work. So here's what the RSI is. It's an indicator. It's, uh, it appears typically below price in an extra window for your chart. Most every charting program around has this. It's a smoothed average of the ratio of average gains to average losses. And then it's normalized so that it is scaled between 0 and 100. That's basically exactly what it is. That's the best description I've ever seen. All right. So let's just take an example. Uh, threw my copy out. Oh, I had to clean out my storage room. It's a great book, Alex. Yeah, I, I pick it up every now and then. And just look, to look at his, ex, uh, his uh, narrative expl uh, explanations of each of them is very intriguing because um, he got the whole thing started with so many of these. Let's just take an example of what we're talking about, average gain to average losses. We're, we're going to take a slice of time here. This is in the Russell. 
And basically, we need to denote where you have average gains and average losses. So here are the gains. Every close to close that was up, for an up close from the previous is considered a gain. All right? And so in this 14-day period, you take all the gains and you ask yourself, what was the average gain when it occurred? And now the other days that appear are these, and what was the average loss that appeared for those average losses? You take then the ratio, 8.58, 13.6, and you run it through this gauntlet, and what you're going to do is determine relative strength, average gain to average losses, and then you normalize it through this formula up here so that it is scaled between 0 and 100. Now what he did, he had a spreadsheet approach where he would basically cancel out you know, 15 periods above and add one underneath, which for the current day, and, he had, and it was a, an efficient way of keeping a spreadsheet then by hand. You can kind of go back in the book and see how he did it. But the bottom line is you'll always have a carryover, and the RSI number from my computer will not necessarily exactly match yours if the starting date of our charts is different. Okay? Are different. So if yours starts three years ago and mine starts ten years ago, they'll, they'll, you know, there'll be a small, small difference between my RSI calculation and yours. Okay? It'll be, and of course, the farther back we go and the, the smaller difference there's in, the, uh, in, in dates, then the smaller difference there'll be in the actual amounts. Okay, so that's what RSI is. Now, what does it look like? It's charted down here between 0 and 100. There's the scale. And generally, then, when you have price making highs and lows and moving in waves, you'll see down here in the RSI, it generally matches the shape of price. Generally, it will match the shape of, of price. As the price goes up and down and moves in trends, RSI down there will generally match it. Now, here's what's important, and here's when you have signals. We have overbought and oversold signals. This is generally when the RSI gets really oversold and turns up from under 30, that would be a bullish signal coming in from out oversold territory. If the RSI goes above 70 and comes down beneath it, that's basically a sell signal coming from overbought territory. All right, now those don't happen that often. Divergences is the other, represents the other signal types. And this is when RSI fails to make new highs when price does, or fails to make new lows when price makes new lows. All right, I'm going to show you an example of these. Overbought, oversold signals. Doesn't happen that often. Here you have an example. This is from the Russell back in, well, you can see back that we're taking a slice of 08 here. But when the Russell would go down below 30, and it would happen a few times a year maybe, and it still does. A few times a year, RSI will drop below 30, and that usually lines up with, it's a pretty good reliable indicator that it's lining up with market bottoms. It just doesn't happen that much. And when it gets over 70, it's a good chance that it's relating to um, you know, market top, at least it's ready for a pullback here. Okay, so but those don't happen that often. The other signals that you'll see are divergent signals. This is when price makes new lows. This, uh, this is bullish divergence. When price makes new lows and the indicator fails to make new lows, okay, confirming this, then that's when we have a bullish divergent condition. And we're going to wait for an up close at that point, and that's when we get in right there. All right. Um, a more aggressive intraday would be to enter in at the, at the high of the previous bar. That would be more of an aggressive intraday entry. But what the indicator is saying is price is making, you know, it's moving down. Indicator moves down. We have a pullback and then a drift downward. But the momentum, this wave coming down here, was not that strong as evidenced by the fact that the RSI failed to make a new low. Okay, 
and that's just indicative that momentum is waning and now kind of like we get into a valley and we're getting ready to go up the other side of the valley up a hillside that's kind of what's happening here it's kind of a, a leading indicator in that it's a predictive indicator let's look at bearish the bearish side price is going up okay indicator goes up price comes down price RSI comes down price makes a new high the RSI fails to make a similar new high indicating that the momentum coming up on this mountaintop is getting ready to turn over and then you would enter on the next low right there or excuse me the lower close alternatively you have entered in you know and wait uh, you know and entered in when a, the low of the previous bar got exceeded something like that but there, you, and then you, oh, in this case, you have a uh, double divergent because price did come down, come up, make a new high here. RSI failed to make a new high, and you had divergence yet again on the downturn. Okay, so divergences represent the other approach to signal determination. So what is our trading premise with regards to credit spread? So remember, when a trend is about to end, we're going to sell premium, a standard deviation out of the money, and challenge the market to move that far. I'm keeping this in the presentation. You guys already know all this, but I'll just bring this back just so we can get kind of a ballpark idea in terms of probabilities. That when you take a standard deviation out of the money, okay, and you stick it in Option Views probability calculators, you can see that the probability of ever touching those 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 levels is roughly between 25 and 30 percent. Now, Brian Johnson, he's not with us here today, I don't think. He's joined us before. He's done a lot of work in this area. He says the number is closer to 30 over here. When he, he's running his own uh, Monte Carlos in his spreadsheets and everything, and he brought he found it, brought in an engine and and got it going. There's a few other probability calculators that are over 30. Option views are pretty consistently between 25 and 30, just depending. Okay, so roughly, if we put this, if we put a, if we sell credit spreads out of the money, more than a standard deviation out of the money, we generally need, um, you know, generally the probability is going to be three times out of seven you'll have losers. So if we can get some kind of a probability of winning greater than 70 to 75 percent something in the 80s or 90s now we're going to have a real strong edge okay now we just have to make sure that when we have those losses that we don't lose our shirt in you know in everything we need plus some so we're going to look at that all right so we're going to we're going to now back test going back in time and you'll see how this works so let's talk about credit spreads Let's talk about credit spreads. You guys know all this, but I just left it in for the review uh, for those that are still kind of new to this, which is okay. In the world of put options, here you have the SPX at 804. 800 would be considered in this matrix the at the money. The out of the monies are the lower price puts. The in the monies are the higher strikes. Here's a typical credit spread, a standard deviation or more away. So these are 25 point strikes coming down, you can see. So if we go to the strike that is the first strike out of the first standard deviation border here, we're going to sell premium just outside that standard deviation and then buy the next one that you see here. We then capture this spread in prices, in this case $3.50. We're capturing that $3.50. And you'll see then, as time goes on, as if, if the SPX remains the same, you'll see that the time benefit of credit spread kicks in. This same spread out an extra month costs $4.50. Okay? One month in where we're looking at this, it's $3.50. If this SPX stays the same, theoretically, and a month goes by, that 350 will become 65 cents. See how that the prices are at 65 cent difference. So you can see then from the prices in the matrix that we have a time benefit. Further, you have a directional benefit. So you have this spread 
is $3.50. If the market were to drift upward um, 25 points, and this spread were to drift downward 25 points to this, these two uh, prices, you'll see that that $3.50 now becomes $2.30. So we're selling it for $3.50. Theoretically, if it goes down 20, if it goes up 25 points in a day, and this drifts down 25 points, we'll immediately make a dollar 20. In theory, all in one day. So there's a combination of things working here: directional benefit and the time benefit, and it's um, uh, you know in in a graphical way depicted here in Option Views graphic analysis screen, where you have today's profit and loss line. We make money if the market trends up. We drift above the break even. As time goes on, of course, this line becomes this one. And, and if price doesn't change, you know, we drift upward and we're making half our yield in short order. Okay, so that's what the picture of the credit spread is. Here's the trading plan. Let me go through this from the bullish side and we'll just invert it for the bearish. Okay, let me get a sip here while you take a look. One moment. All right, for a bullish trade setup, we first need a divergent condition that exists, where the underlying is making lower lows while the RSI fails to make lower lows. And we're just looking there for various, you know, for basically valleys, where you have price coming down, making new lows, and the RSI um, fails to make a new low, like that. But we need definite valleys here, okay, definite valleys. Um, and once we have that condition, an up close marks the entry point. We're going to wait for the close and we'll enter at the close of the, uh, in this case, an up close from the previous close. Okay? On that close, we'll initiate a bull push spread with a short strike located just over one standard deviation out of the money. To determine that level, we'll use a probability calculator. We'll use the at-the-money call implied as the volatility input. Now, uh, let me say this real quick. I've, I'm in great communication with Brian Johnson. He's written a couple books. He's contributed to some of the modeling that Len Yates has put in regarding earnings. And so we're discussing um, the volatility input for determining on strategies like this. Um, uh, this approach dates back to, I think we started looking at this in 2005. Probably 10, 11 years now, we've been revisiting this every few years, every year and a half, two years, just to see how this strategy goes. And we're just going to stay consistent, but look for in the future perhaps some uh, um, more advanced approaches to determining the volatility that goes into determining that deviation. We're going to go to the first month with over 21 days. Recently, I had to flip this to a few weeklies because the strikes just weren't appearing and they weren't traded in a month farther out now that we have all these weeklies coming out. So I had to vary that. But in all cases, you want to go to the first expiry, if not the month, over 21 days. And I'm going primarily to the months and not using the weeklies in this case. In, just to stay consistent with the way we started this years before we had weekly options. All right, how much yield? We want to make sure that we have at least 5% yield when we do these. Okay, otherwise we'll skip the trade. If, if the implied volatilities are so low, and we go a standard deviation out and can't get a 5% yield, typically on the call side, on a bear call spread, well, then we're going to skip it. We want at least a 5% yield there, okay? Finally, we're going to make sure and do only one trade at a time. We are not going to put on multiple bear call spreads, uh, we'll instead wait for one to get finished before we contemplate another one. Same thing with the bears, with the, uh, uh, um, with the other side as well. We will not have um, going, them going on at once. How do we get out of this? We basically remove the position if the underlying touches the short strike. Otherwise, we let it expire worthless. Okay. And that's what happens 94% of the time. Expires worthless. Um, there's about 6% of the time so far is that it will move and touch that short strike. And it'll go ahead and violate our premise 
and move that full standard deviation or more in the direction of the trend after it's already been determined to be waning, and it'll touch it. And that's when we get out is the moment it touches the short strike intraday. All right, let's go take a look. Oh, here's just a few trades. I don't know if I got into the... No, I just showed you from a chart. Okay, so here's an example. We had the market go up, down, and up. We had a couple peaks. We had, a, and you want to have two peaks. You want to have peaks go on. And there's one that's pretty close together, separated by just a single, uh, um, a single, uh, uh, you know, two days of prices basically. Okay, and so at that point, when we had the condition, we then enter on the down close right there. And on that point, we would sell premium out of the money here. And in this case, the market kept going down, and this premium expired worthless. Market never did come up and touch that level. Okay, we, we did the 870, 880, way up here. Okay, down here. We had the market come down, up, and down. The RSI came down, up, and failed to make it on the first up close there. We went ahead and sold a bull call spread, oh, excuse me, a bull put spread. We sold the July 670, way down here, okay? And in this case, it, it, never did, it never did come touch it. Market reverse course and went the other way. So those were two winners, as you can see. Testing result, I'm going to show you the hypothetical returns based on our back trader module. Past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. All right, so I went through, and there were a total of, and this is from January of 04. January of 04, through last year, 2015. Okay, and that's about the... You know, you look at 11, 12 years. Um, 66 total trades, 94% of them were winners, 62 winners, 4 losers. Um, the average winner made 485, the average loser lost 1263. Okay, all in all, pretty darn good. At one point, we had 29 straight winners. We did have two straight losses. Emotionally, that's a brutal thing, but you got to be prepared for that. All right, so those are the broad statistics. I'm going to carve these up in just a second between call side and put side. I think that's kind of interesting. Are you picking out divergences by hand, or do you have a way of automating that process? John, I was doing it by hand. I have set up Metastock program, and I need to refine it more to do a scan for divergences. The the additional the additional thing you have to add and make sure this is what I did is by hand is always making sure you have a dip. Okay, we want to make sure we have the actual dip here uh, in in RSI, where you have price the highs making a dip and these making a dip, and the RSI making a dip as well. But yeah, right now, absolutely, just looking at doing it by hand. Um, but I am exploring scanning in Metastock to find those divergences. The equity curve. You could see there were a couple times, probably the two losses right there in a row, perhaps right there, I believe. Last this last August, so I, I stopped doing looking at this about right here. This is the last time we did an update was right there. Or so so all you see here is what's happened since the August this last summer was you know we had a loss right there. It kind of took us down, um, but generally you can see that that uh, all in all pans out pretty darn well. Um, anything here? I started with just a ten thousand dollar beginning balance here in o excuse me o five is when we began o five and this has just been straight using in the Russell ten point spreads five 
five lots. Five lots of 10-point spreads. Okay, not compounding it. Of course, if you were to compound this, you know, you know, once you, you know, like say, once you get an extra thousand, two thousand bucks, you add a sixth contract. Okay, for every, uh, for every two thousand extra dollars in your account, you add a contract, something like that. Um, this would certainly have blasted off, like that. Of course, you, we had done that. And that'd be fun to do, to just display this line versus compounding at every extra two thousand bucks you throw in a. Uh, you throw in an extra lot. Now, of course, this drawdown would have been greater as well. So you got to watch that. That might be an extra little. Uh, t that that would be a fun little topic to do, actually. Even with the flat five lots, annualized return pretty strong, of course. Here are the trades I gave you. If you wanted to go back, check it out yourself. I gave you the dates. Um, never mind the description. I don't know if those are necessarily. Some of them are the long strike. Some of them are the short strike. Okay, because the uh, um, under the description it kind of varied. I, I you know when I you know when I when I converted options report to a spreadsheet in constructing this, um, but you can kind of just get a feel for what we were talking about. Here are the two losses in a row. Back in 08, of course, that was the fall of 08. That created that to the two losses in a row. Otherwise, you have just two other losses occurring. You have 2010. Then you have the recent one in August. The whole August thing that we had this last summer. Now let's divvy it up. Let's see. Uh, the Mona Lisa thinks this is a thing of beauty. <laughs> if you get 80% of your yield in a short time, would it be better to close them again? Uh, Lewis, absolutely. I think absolutely. I mean, and, 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 absolutely. But you you got to watch that long strike, of course, because sometimes the long strike is tough to, you know, to get rid of. But but you know, and, and get your fills and everything. So, but absolutely, if you can pull it off with a good yield in in a half of time, you know, that's a whole other aspect to this that I think has a lot of credibility. Because then you open up the capital to put on another trade. And, and keep your capital working much better that way. There were a few times now that these don't, these signals don't happen that often. That's the thing. You're freeing up your capital, but you don't know if you if you have another signal flashing, and the previous like a bear call spread say market's been trending up. Okay, you had a bear call spread you put on. And then now you and then and then that's making money now, but you have another bear call spread signal, and you're making money on the first one. Go ahead and take off the first one and put on the second one. You could you could play around with that. But what I did is I just went through the chart and first marked the chart on the dates that these are, that the divert occurred, and then I went through Option Views Back Trader and just ripped through it and did the and, and filled it in and did the back test that way. I think there's a lot of validity to that. Final screen in today's presentation. I'm divvying up these between calls and puts. On the bear call spreads, we had 41 bear call spreads, 25 bull put spreads. Of the, on the call side, we had 40 winners out of 41. On the put side, three of the four losers came on the put sides. Uh, let's see. I'm using the synthetic equivalent of a credit spread. That means buying the spread on the other side. Um, well, so Alex, what, you, what you're saying, I believe, is that in sell, instead of selling a bull put spread, okay, you would go to the calls and do a bull call spread that's deep in the money. Okay. Now the problem with that is, is those deep in the money options often are going to have much wider spreads, and you'll have a much more difficult time getting those filled at a decent price. So keep that in mind. That's the whole premise behind. Um, and Frank has teed off on this a lot in his presentations. That's why he shifted over all of his accounts to using iron butterflies, 
um, uh, where he's dealing with out of the money options as much as possible um, and avoiding those deep, deep in the money options where the spreads are much wider, the liquidity is worse. Okay, so that's why we just deal with out of the money credit spreads here. Okay, so we have the losers, one call, three puts. The average, look at this, the on the call side, remember, on the call side, the market's going up and up and up and up. Okay, then we have price making a new high, we have failure, and then we think this is the top, and we get in. Well, by this time that it's topping, implied volatility is quite low. So we're not going to collect as much premium as on the put side when markets are going down, 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 come up, make new lows, yet the indicator fails to make a new low. We're going to jump in. Well, implied volatility is much fatter in these environments. So that's why you have the average winner of the puts is much higher than the calls. Now, aside from that, and to Brian Johnson's point, you know, on the call, the calls, when you go into those out-of-the-money calls, the implied volatility, the expectation of movement is much lower than in the out-of-the-money puts. And there's a case to be made for using a different implied volatility standard deviation determination when you're determining bear call spreads placement versus the bull put spread placement. Okay? And that's a topic for in the future. I'm doing some work on that now and um, hopefully we can, hopefully I can get it into my Metastock program to uh, more quickly uh, get us that information on multiple assets and not just the SPX. So we're working on that though. All right, that's it. That's it. I think this is a very valid approach. It's just um, you, the signals don't happen all that often. This is just in the RSI. I'd encourage you to go ahead and this is something you could easily do using just a, any charting program, option views as the RSI. Just anything you can mark. In option view you can mark it using the little trend line line and mark the dates, go through Backtrader, throw it on there for any asset and um, also and if I were to do an iteration of this I would also look at different uh, uh, look back periods on the RSI. You don't have to use 14. You can use 10. You can use 8. A lot of Forex people, I noticed, have a real strong way of uh, using various look-back periods on the RSI. But, you know, I know uh, uh, that guy, Andy Cardwell, he's made a, he does everything RSI. He just keeps it at 14 and then does moving averages of that 14 RSI and plays around with just the 14 RSI, that alone. So, Anyway, folks, thanks so much. We'll be back next week with the Core Strategy Review. Take care. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.